from SIGOPT, an Intel company, I'm Mike McCourt, and this is Experiment Exchange. When the simulations are a good enough predictor of, of what's going to happen, then the thing that we mainly do is, is to build surrogate for the simulations. Today, we have with us Rafael Gomez Bombarelli, Assistant Professor of Materials Processing at MIT. His research group is focused on the development of machine learning strategies to design new materials, including fluids, cloths, metals, and nanomaterials. We discuss how SIGOPT is used in his lab to automate the tedious tasks of model building, such as hyperparameter optimization, and reach state-of-the-art performance. We also dive into an exciting topic, inverse design, where the desired properties of a material can be enumerated and a search can be conducted for such materials using a tool such as SIGOPT. Ladies and gentlemen, we have another exciting installment of SIGOPT's Experiment Exchange. Today, we have a real treat, Rafael Gomez Bambarelli, Assistant Professor in Materials Processing at MIT. Rafa, it's great to have you today. Thanks very much for having me and for the opportunity to chat about our work. Absolutely. And in particular, your work is what we really want to talk about. Uh, in November of 2021, you spoke at the SIGAP Summit about a, sort of a variety of exciting topics, all of which involve this, this key question, how is it that we can have these physical simulations, simulations from first principles, oftentimes we're solving some sort of boundary value problem or Monte Carlo method. And then on the other end of this continuum, we've got these ML strategies, incredibly powerful, incredibly fast, but very data hungry. And you talked about going back and forth uh, sort of between the two and how you can leverage ML to make big things happen. I'd like you to tell us about that today, please. Fantastic. And, and I think that was a great summary. And, and uh, we believe, and you know, other people in, in the field, obviously, too, that, that there is a computational science line uh, that connects sort of the way people have been thinking about simulating physics in computers uh, with the type of tasks that machine learning has proven very effective for. And, you know, we've seen DeepMind just had a DFT paper uh, last week, right? So clearly, this, these lines are blurring. And we're very excited about, about using all these tools together. And in particular, the, the type of problems we like to tackle are design problems, right? This is trying to use these algorithms uh, to invent. Uh, that means that, you know, when we can bootstrap data, when, when the simulations are a good enough predictor of, of what's going to happen, then the thing that we mainly do is, is to build surrogate for the simulations, right? So instead of investing whatever, you know, n cube, n fourth, n to the fifth uh, power uh, computational method, we do a little bit of that and then train a, a surrogate model. And for instance, something we've been finding very exciting lately is to use uh, differentiable uncertainty to go hunt for the places where the surrogate models are, are breaking down, right? So we take the derivative of, of the uncertainty of the model with respect to the inputs and go pinpoint the holes uh, that it has. Uh, in the surrogate functions, right? So, so that's a, a set of tools that, that we use a lot. Is training a surrogate for expensive but but uh, accurate uh, physics-based simulation. And that's a fantastic uh, idea. There, this question of how can we identify where the model we have today is either least certain or probably least accurate. That sounds uh, like when you describe it like active learning. Is that a variant of active learning? Absolutely. And there's something we, we, we've been very interested in, right? Again, we've, we've got an oracle, right? We've got a ground truth that we can call over as many times as we want. Um, and, you know, we can do it by night. We can do it in parallel. We can use a DOE supercomputer. So it's, it's not like mechanical talk, right? Where you, you do need to get a cohort. You do need to... Sp spinning up the oracle for us takes very little cost, right? Mm -hmm. So we've, we've been known to set up these active learning circles for, uh, cycles for these surrogate functions, uh, very often, right? And sometimes it takes, you know, five, seven, ten generations of interplaying the, the machine learning and the Oracle. And that's that's what brought us to trying to find the holes actively in, 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 in the machine learning models mm -hmm. uh, by doing this uh, differentiable uncertainty. Really exciting right there. It's really exciting. And I think that that 
uh, speaks to this, this need for sample efficiency. Be because you're right, you can run the numerical simulation whenever you want. You don't need a thousand people to respond to your survey. You can run it at your leisure, but it is costly, right? Uh, when you're running one of these, whether it's your, your DFT or particle and cell simulations or magnetohydrodynamics, it's, it's costly. What sort of expense are we talking about here when you're doing these computations? Can you give this is a very good point. That's, yeah, I, I, I was just checking. So for instance, we, we did the, so this, the type of simulations we, for, for ground states, uh, for instance, take, you know, hundreds of CPU hours uh, to, to run a single sort of valuable data point. Um, but um, there is more excited simulations that we use, uh, more uh, expensive simulations that we use for excited states. So this is to understand the optical properties of molecules. And, and if you've ever seen these glasses that change colors when you're outside, they get dark and, yeah. So the mechanism by what's happening, that's a molecule whose motions are governed by, by this complicated physics that is really hard to simulate. And the surrogate model for that made us literally a million times faster, right? So the neural network <laughs> takes uh, <laughs> milliseconds to sample and, and the underlying the ground truth takes, you know, uh, of the order of tens of hours or hundreds of hours. Uh, uh, to that's get us, to get us a single so model. exciting. That's just an incredible idea that you're able to get this amazing speed up uh, partly because you're leveraging your, your physics knowledge to, to design the data that you're creating effectively, and also because of the power of these ML tools. Exactly. And, and again, this is a place where hyperparameter optimization has really come to a rescue. And again, I, I talked about this in my talk, and since then to now, it has happened again, where a student came and they were, I trained the model, it learns, but it's just not very good, right? Like, I, I, you know, it's, it's, it's learned what it's supposed to, but the loss is just not good enough to do the simulations that we want with the surrogate. And it's always the same answer. You hook it up, let it run. It will, it will, you know, it will send some JSONs. It will send you some values back. Just set it. Come back a week from now or a few days from now. Uh, it got twice as good. So literally, it was the same data, the same thing. Uh, and it's happened again. I, I talked about this in my, uh, uh, back in November, and it's happened again since then that somebody's got, their whole project got qualitatively better uh, by, by hooking into hyperparameter optimization. Uh, that's exciting. That's really, really, really exciting. I love to hear that. I believe me, the research team loves to hear that because sometimes uh, we're sitting back here working on some stuff. We're like, boy, is this actually helping? Is it actually valuable? Whenever we hear that, we're like, this is why. This is why SIGOPT exists, is to help these projects uh, become more effective as efficiently as possible. Can I ask, uh, what are these surrogates modeling in this particular situation? You talked about color here. Is that one of the key things you're trying to model? So yes, one, one of the things we do, particularly for instance, in, in this uh, excited state molecule that, that is really expensive to simulate, uh, we're modeling how quickly the color will return to your glasses, right? If, if that molecule was put in glasses. And, and the specific application is to make um, photopharmaceuticals. These are drugs that switch with light, right? Wow. So ideally you want a molecule with a very narrow set of, of properties um, that you would illuminate and it twists uh, and, and achieves the desired conformation that binds your target. And you know, a lot of modeling has been done around how molecules interact with their biological targets. Mm -hmm. But this property is really quantum and it's really, really expensive. So even though all your drug discovery pipeline can process, you know, millions of data points, then this property that is really important for this class of molecules goes mm -hmm. at, you know, one a day or two a day or, or yeah. whatever. You also talked about something interesting in, in your presentation. You talked about the need for multi-fidelity work here. And in my mind, when I hear about something that's reaching the cost of quantum chromodynamics or whatever, one simulation a day, one simulation a week, it takes a whole supercomputer to do. I think about the opportunity, but also the complexity of multi-fidelity modeling, simulation, and maybe even eventually optimization. Can you tell us all about how you're using multi-fidelity methods right now? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And um, I think this is something that um, people in machine learning have, have done for a long time in, in the context of transfer learning. And, and there is very clear successes there where you pre-train a model on, on language A, and it turns out you can transfer with, you know, just 1% of the data to language B. That a lot of these underlying data structures and, and connections can be learned. Mm -hmm. um, and we found that in, the chem in chemistry and in materials, it's more subtle. 
it's not clear what properties and, and what uh, domains will transfer to one another. So it's, it's something that people have tried. For instance, it's very common when you're doing graph. Uh, so molecules are graphs, and, and the neural network architecture that people use on molecules is graph neural networks. Um, pre-training, in general, for graph tasks, pre-training on things like um, graph completion, right? You, you take out some nodes, and you train a machine learning model to predict where the holes, what should fill the holes in a graph. Mm -hmm. That typically really helps graph model for other tasks. And it really doesn't help for molecules. Like pre-training on, on a model that, you know, knows how to complete a molecule doesn't really help for other tasks that are related to the molecule, to the properties. Um, so, but again, we've got this oracle that we can call as many times as we want in terms of our physics-based simulations. So we do have this interplay between experiment, right? Experiment is king. It's, it's the thing that, that truly, you know, is it's where, where the rubber meets the road. Mm -hmm. um, and we've got our surrogate that, you know, has some accuracy and it's uh, uh, cheaper to call. Um, so it's not exactly a transfer learning problem. When, when the two are sort of very disparate in size, then yes, mm -hmm. it looks like pre-training with the theory, transferring to the experiment. Uh, that it seems fairly straightforward. But what we found that there is, there is domains where, you know, the amount of computational data we have is commensurate with the amount of experimental data there is. They, they might not mm -hmm. be on exactly the same domains, but they're commensurate. And then we've, we've been exploring ways to sort of have them talk to one another um, sort of an, on an equal footing more than as a pre-trained model, um, if wow. that makes sense. That's very interesting. It's very, very exciting. And, and along this topic of this interplay between the physics and the ML as it manifests in a variety of different contexts here, I'm wondering, can you, are there any instances where you're utilizing the physics knowledge of your system, such as the pressure must be positive or energy comes in quantized states or what have you, to somehow change how your surrogate model performs. Is that something that's possible or is that is that too complicated or too far afield? No, there is, there is lots of examples uh, with that. And uh, for instance, we, we don't do a lot of continuum simulations, but uh, the continuum simulations people that do you know, uh, fluid dynamics or that sort of work, are really excited about um, auto differentiability mm -hmm. in, in the differential, uh, in the ODE, in the uh, differential equations that govern the behavior of their systems, which become learnable. Mm -hmm. uh, we've, we've done a little bit work on that, right? It's because our systems follow Hamiltonian dynamics, so we can, we can learn a surrogate for the dynamics, right? Not a surrogate for the Hamiltonian, but a surrogate gotcha. for the dynamic evolution. Um, so that's, that's something uh, we're, we're definitely um, interested in. Uh, but there's lots of examples. For instance, energy uh, is, is a, a, an intensive, pro uh, an extensive property. If you get twice the molecule, mm -hmm. it should have twice the energy. So the way people have taken this on is, for instance, making the energy prediction a per atom partition. So when you have a molecule that is made of a lot of atoms, instead of predicting the energy for the whole molecule as a task, right? So it's not a graph task because you mm -hmm. don't want to predict the energy of the molecule. You predict the energy of each atom, which mm. is a, a non, it's, it's, an, it's not a measurable thing. It's not something that exists. And then add them up. And that automatically gets you uh, a size extensivity, right? Because the properties arise from atoms. And then there is a very exciting work, not from us, but, but from Tessa Schmidt, who just came to MIT and, and started her independent group here mm -hmm. around symmetry and equivariance. And, and it's such beautiful work where adding high dimensional channels to neural networks suddenly makes the same data, you know, tens or hundreds of times more efficient in terms of, of training models by wow. having the neural network preserve the same symmetries as, as our physical reality has. That is exciting. And you're right. That's exactly the kind of property that I was thinking about there. So that's, uh, that's fantastic. You mentioned something that, uh, yeah, I, I neglected to mention earlier, which is, you're right, you're not studying continuum properties, you're working on these, these molecules. And obviously that has complications in inputting data into any sort of ML tool. Fair enough, graph convolutional tools exist today and they're certainly evolving to better serve your purpose. But in my mind, the place we're living in these I'll call them discrete spaces just for simplicity, is really a, a complicated situation, uh, is in the context of inverse problems. Uh, because now you've got this space 
where searching the space is somehow very complicated, it's very tricky. Can, can you talk about that at all? Absolutely, yeah, and, and, and it, it's a nice segue. So we've been talking a lot about forward models, right, that given, given an input uh, predict its properties, right, so it's a surrogate for some physics, or maybe we don't have the physics and it's just a surrogate for experiment, right? Somebody was measuring the activity of drugs and then we train a machine learning model that goes from the structure of the drug to its predictive activity. So these are really useful tools to invent as long as you have a finite list of candidates to go over, right? But if, if you only have a design space that's uh, open-ended, then it's not immediately clear how to apply the forward model, right? You still need somebody to come up with suggestions about yeah. what to try. Uh, and that's what we call the inverse uh, design problem in, in the physical sciences, which is mm -hmm. given the property, what is the material or the molecule that achieves it? Right. And uh, you, you hit the nail right on the head, right? Because our, uh, our structures, our data structures are uh, permutation invariant, right? Mm -hmm. If I re-index uh, which atom is one and which atom is 15 in my molecule, I should get the same answer. Right. Yeah. Um, and graph convolutions uh, do that job, right? They take the permutation invariance uh, on the on the encoding. But mm -hmm. if you want to write a graph, suddenly things get, get very complicated. Um, yeah. So we started doing this. There is a very friendly representation of molecules based on strings. And language models are so good that uh, taking molecules, writing them as text, and then throwing transformers at them is actually a good solution, right? It's, it's, it's not the, the most elegant, perhaps, in terms of, of the yeah. data structures involved. Yeah. Um, and, and again, just today, I was, I was rehashing with, with a collaborator the fact that one needs to do data augmentation for, to tackle the permutation invariance of, of mm -hmm. the graph, right? So you need to show the same molecule, in, you know, A to B uh, and, and C to A, mm -hmm. such that it learns to just as people do with images and, and yeah. uh, data augmentation for, for uh, optical, uh, for uh, machine vision, well, we need to do the same thing for, for generating strings that will eventually be molecular graphs. Um, but it's, it's a very exciting place. We've seen some uh, early hits, you know, there have been some papers out there. There is uh, a number of companies that are, that are trying to build inverse molecular design uh, models in the practice, and, and it's a very exciting field, yeah. It is, and, and boy, oh boy, I really love to hear the idea that a topic, natural language processing, which doesn't immediately seem, seem so close, is able to bring in and have this effect. And natural language processing itself is a, is a hot growing field. And what you're working on is even a hotter, newer growing field. And, and to see them uh, have this exciting interplay, this exciting opportunity for new results solving cutting edge problems right now, I personally find extremely exciting. It's one of the things that really excites me about the ML community right now, but also, let me say, ML conferences right now. Now, a lot of the content, obviously, at conferences is still very uh, specific to, to key standard ML problems, but you're, you're getting more and more content published on applications and in particular at workshops. If I'm not mistaken, you had some content at a NeurIPS workshop, the Learning uh, Meaningful Representations of Life workshop, which is, is trying to, to push things forward. And personally, I always feel like these workshops are the place where you get this cool crossover, the cool new ideas, the things that, all right, maybe aren't quite at the published level yet because you haven't figured out how to talk about it the right way, but you're at the cutting edge. Uh, do you often find yourself at workshops? Do you often find new ideas at workshops? Absolutely. And, and I think that's, that's a great point. Um, the, I think the workshops in, at the machine learning conferences are the places where I have the most fun as a scientist yeah, in, in terms of sort of what's out there, what's cooking out there. Yeah. I, you know, um, it's very hard to get papers into machine learning conferences uh, as, as full papers. And I understand, right? They need to hit a community that is very diverse. They need to be yeah. diverse tools that are, you know, mathematically sound, uh, hard, right? There's, there's a lot of nuance in what that community uh, regards as, as a top accomplishment. But then the workshops are such an amazing yeah. outlet because, you know, people, yeah. people have a fast pace, you know, you, you present things that are 99% there yeah. and, and you're going to nail them down in the next few weeks. They get the conversation going, uh, and, and it's been really exciting for us. Like you said, we had also their, their blind, uh, which is something I love from machine learning conferences. So you know, the same student got two amazing uh, uh, 
a, a post test accepted because uh, maybe maybe the reviewers didn't know it was him twice doing two different things. <laughs> um, but but in general, yes, we found those those um, it's and again the, the computer scientists are there and then they come by and they they contribute and you know Max Welling is obviously a big guy that has been yeah. has been around for a, for a long time in these conferences and in these workshops and, and a key driver of. of you know, having the computer science people look back at us, uh, the computational science people. Agreed. Agreed. And I just, I love, I just love the opportunity that they bring is yet to get people in the same room talking about stuff and not everything perfectly hits me when I go to a workshop. Sometimes I'm like, hey, I don't know anything about this. Sorry. I can't really talk to you, but there's so much, there's so much great content. There's so many cool people, excited people, energetic people. That's what I love. That's what I miss from in-person conferences, which I hope will be coming back in a little bit here, which then brings me to my last question. What are you looking forward to in 2022? Um, well, definitely uh, in-person conferences uh, coming back, that's, that's uh, pretty high at the list. Um, uh, on the on the research side, I think we've got a, a number of tools come together. Uh, for instance, we've got a, a, a really nice generative uh, paper, so in the sort of inverse design idea, uh, over 3D molecular structure. So I, I, and okay. I think the whole field in general, so it's, it's a, some one contribution, but the whole field is thinking in, in a way that I find very exciting about sampling not just graphs, but cloud points, right? So constructing a, a 3D molecular structure is sampling a cloud point. Yeah. Um, and you know, there is, there is, I think it's a problem that other people relate to in uh, maybe machine vision, right? Or, or in uh, sort Definitely. of uh, scene creation. Uh, and uh, the molecules that we're trying to generate also have this 3D aspect uh, attached yeah. to them. So I think and for the community, I, I sense a, a, a nice uh, you know, opportunity coming up in, in uh, generation of, of 3D data sets. Yeah, me too. Me too. And I'm looking forward to that as well. Outstanding. Uh, that's all the time we have for today. Uh, thank you, Rafa, so much for stopping by. It is an absolute pleasure. Thanks very much. All right. Thank you. And everybody who's watching, have a wonderful day. We'll see you next time at SIGUPT Experiment Exchange. If you have enjoyed these interviews and want to learn more, the description below contains the link to the show notes. There you will find links to the papers we reference, supplemental material, and a transcription. We hope to see you here next time on Experiment Exchange.